The SR-71 Blackbird still holds the records for the highest sustained altitude and highest top speed of any jet aircraft, flying at 26 kilometers above the ground, and Mach 3.2. Developed in the 1960s during the height of Cold War paranoia, the aircraft was designed to allow the US to peer behind the Iron Curtain of the Soviet Union. The first effective method of flying over the Soviet Union to gather vital information, without being destroyed by surface-to-air missiles, was extreme altitude. Lockheed's U-2 was developed and brought home invaluable photos of the military movements and capability of the USSR, all from a lofty height of 21,300 meters. This worked well for four years, but after a missile brought down Gary Powers' U-2 in 1960, a new tactic was needed. Speed. The pursuit of this speed resulted in the SR-71. Speed was its purpose, its defense and its greatest enemy. And so work began on the first of the Blackbirds. Blackbirds, plural, because whilst the SR-71 is the most famous of them, it had two predecessors, the A-12 and the YF-12A. The A-12 was the first variant, flown by the CIA. It was a reconnaissance aircraft like the SR-71 and performed to a very similar level. It was a little under two meters shorter and used slightly less powerful engines, but could still reach Mach 3.2 and could actually fly about a kilometer higher due to being a little lighter. From the A-12, the YF-12A interceptor was developed. It was the same size as the A-12, but it was a little heavier on account of the weapon systems. The standout visual differences are in its extended underside fins to aid in stability, the cutback chines, the sharp edge around the body to allow for radar systems and missiles, and the second seat designed for a weapons officer. The last of the Blackbirds, so called because of the black paint that adorned them, was the SR-71. The SR-71 took the lessons learned from the A-12 and YF-12A before it and rolled them into a new design. The SR-71 was a little longer, a little more powerful and a little more robust. The speed attained by the SR-71 truly boggles the mind. Three times the speed of sound. Faster than a rifle bullet, one mile every two seconds, 3,529 kilometers per hour, Mach 3.2. This mind-blowing speed generated intense frictional heat. Despite the air being 40 times less dense at the 26 kilometer altitude it was flying at. Parts of the body had to endure heats of over 560 degrees centigrade. So to build an aircraft capable of cruising at the required Mach 3, New materials had to be created, and new tools also had to be created to work with these exotic materials. The Blackbird's airframe had to be lightweight, and also able to deal with the rigors of Mach 3 flight. This really only left one option, titanium, which made up 85% of the SR-71 by weight. There were two major issues with titanium. It was a pain to work with, and the United States didn't have nearly enough to build the aircraft they needed. Soviet Russia did have enough titanium, so the CIA, through dummy companies, bought the titanium for the aircraft from the Soviet Union, who were none the wiser. Titanium was a much harder material than they were used to, so drill bits and cutting heads wore out substantially faster. But then there was the obscure stuff. Titanium is reactive with chlorine and cadmium, amongst other things. They found that bolt heads would simply fall off after heat treatment. It turned out that the cadmium in the spanners they used would leave microscopic residue on the bolts, causing them to degrade, so new tools were forged from titanium. The titanium needed to be washed in water prior to use, but during the summer they found the titanium would deteriorate. It turns out that to avoid algae blooms in the water supply, the local water authority would chlorinate the water in the summer. From start to finish the titanium was fraught with problems but at the time it was the only material capable of delivering the required resilience. Now, the SR-71 was incredibly fast, but surface-to-air missiles of the time were in fact faster. Whilst the Blackbird did utilize basic stealth technology and electronic countermeasures, its main defense was its speed. If the SR-71 could be locked onto, the missile needed to intercept the aircraft, and therein lies the problem. The missile could reach the altitude, and match the speed of the SR-71, but it barely had the time to do it. A surface-to-air missile has an upper altitude limit and a lateral range limit. 
And whilst these were quite large, the SR-71 moved so quickly that it would come into range and then be out in a very short amount of time. On top of this, if the SR-71 accelerated or turned at all, the point at which the missile could intercept could change by many miles. Add to that the fact that the missiles were controlled from the ground, and the time it took to recalculate intercept trajectories meant that, despite thousands of missiles having been fired at the SR-71 over its service life, not a single one was lost to enemy fire. The closest a Blackbird ever came to being shot down occurred during October of 1967, over North Vietnam. One of the CIA-operated A-12 aircraft was engaged by a number of SA-2 surface-to-air missiles. Once on the ground, a small piece of shrapnel was found lodged in the wing. The cameras the aircraft was carrying captured no fewer than six missile trails. Speed was the Blackbird's greatest defence, but it was also its greatest threat. On January 25th, 1966, Bill Weaver and Jim Zweyer took off from Edwards Air Force Base in California to undertake a test flight. 24 kilometers above the Earth and traveling a Mach 3.18, they began to turn. As they turned, their right engine suffered from an unstart, a phenomenon that results in the engine suddenly losing thrust and a violent yawing of the aircraft. The aircraft fell into a more severe turn and pitched up, both the pilot and the stability control systems fought against the turn to no avail. Within three seconds, the aircraft was out of control and breaking up. Neither occupant had the time to eject from the aircraft, but as the plane disintegrated around them, they were ripped from their seats. As this happened, Jim Zareya was killed, but incredibly, Bill Weaver regained consciousness just before his parachute deployed. He had fallen from a height of 24 kilometers, and had been flung out of an aircraft traveling three times the speed of sound, and had only sustained some bruises and a mild whiplash. At three and a half thousand kilometers per hour, if things go wrong, they go wrong fast. The two monstrous engines that provided the force for all of this speed required a lot of fuel, about a ton per minute at full power. The aircraft could hold over 46,000 liters of fuel, weighing around 36 tons. The empty aircraft only weighed around 26 tons, meaning a fully fueled SR-71 was more fueled than plane. But even carrying all this fuel, because of how thirsty the engines were, a typical mission would usually require anywhere between two and four in-flight refuels. Flying an aircraft is always a team effort, but this was especially true with the SR-71, and especially true in regards to the in-flight refueling. If the tankers weren't available, the SR-71 wasn't going anywhere. Now, air-to-air -air refueling is an impressive feat at the best of times, keeping two aircraft traveling at hundreds of kilometers per hour in near-perfect alignment for minutes at a time is mind-boggling. But that is usually undertaken by small and relatively agile aircraft, not aircraft the size of commercial jetliners. To refuel these smaller aircraft, it genuinely only takes five minutes or so. The Blackbird is a different story altogether, having to stay connected for a quarter of an hour. These difficulties are not unique to the SR-71, but what is unique is what it had to do to stay connected to the tanker. In the final minutes of refueling, when the aircraft was heavy with fuel, it would start to struggle to keep up with the fuel tanker, despite being at full military power. In the final minutes, it had to engage one of its afterburners. You engaged the left afterburner, and then adjusted the right engine's thrust continuously to keep the appropriate distance from the tanker. Of course, this led to greatly asymmetric thrust, so the aircraft would yaw wildly, and you had to look out of the side window whilst performing a drift in a Mach 3 aircraft. You lit the left afterburner, so you would yaw right, and therefore be looking out of the left side of the aircraft, because that was the only side that had defoggers. In the average mission, the Blackbird had to drop down from its lofty cruising altitude two to four times to hook up to a tanker. On the longest mission the SR-71 ever undertook, flying from New York to the Middle East and back again, it refueled no fewer than 14 times. There's another well-known fuel fact about the Blackbird. It leaked fuel like a sieve. This is true, but there was a valid reason for it. The SR-71 used a wet wing design, meaning the wing itself contained the fuel. It had no internal fuel tanks. Metal tanks would have been too heavy. Plastic ones would have melted. As the aircraft heated from friction whilst traveling a Mach 3, the metal panels of its wings would expand. Over the length of the aircraft, this added up to eight to 10 centimeters. 
If everything was a snug fit, this expansion would cause the panels to buckle and warp. To avoid this, tiny gaps were left between them. Sealant was used liberally and reapplied regularly. However, the constant cycle of being heated as the aircraft cruised at speed, and then it cooling as it descended to refuel, where cold fuel would be pumped into the tanks, meant that the sealant cracked and graded. This meant that whilst the aircraft sat on the ground, it would leak fuel profusely. You can see this in footage of the SR-71. The surfaces often look slick, and that's jet fuel. If normal jet fuel were used, this would be a huge fire risk. In fact, if normal jet fuel was used, the fuel would explode inside the wings at speed. A special fuel was developed called JP-7, which was so resistant to ignition that you could drop a lit match into it and nothing would happen. Now about that top speed, Mach 3.2 is the quoted top speed, and you'll be forgiven for imagining that means the aircraft topped out with the engines at full power, but that wasn't the case. The top speed was limited by the temperature of the engine inlets. Faster speeds would raise the temperature above safe limits and would damage the engines. During an escape from surface-to-air missiles above Libya, one SR-71 pilot stated that he reached Mach 3.5, thanks primarily to some colder than expected temperatures. There's no way to confirm that story, but regardless of whether top speed was Mach 3.2 or 3.5, it still holds the record for the fastest air-breathing jet aircraft. The SR-71 program was officially terminated in 1989. With reactivations and NASA scientific research, a limited number flew until 1999, but none have flown since then. There were a great many problems with the SR-71. They were expensive, they were getting old, satellites could provide much of the same information without risking lives. There were some very good reasons to retire the planes, and there were some short-sighted political reasons too. The Blackbird was of another time, both very much a product of 1960s engineering and yet also somehow entirely space age, even 60 years after its creation. It's unlikely there'll ever be another aircraft like the SR-71, and the world is a little less interesting for it. If you liked the video, perhaps consider subscribing.